Uh, we have a really great audience today. There's over 900 people registered for today's event, which is a really great turnout and shows the strength of the nonprofit sector overall. Um, we had questions submitted from the community prior to the event that we have and will share with all of the candidates. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today, uh, for joining us on social media, um, and for, for sending us your questions. So uh, we're going to be joined today by two candidates um, from equity for all workers to fair contracts and needed community investments. The nonprofit sector has a lot at stake in the 2021 mayoral election. And we're really happy um, to speak to the candidates about how their ideas and policy platforms engage with community nonprofits. Um, this initiative was spearheaded by the Advocacy Institute, the nonprofit, nonprofit New York, and the Human Services Council, and brought together over 100 groups uh, from across the New York City nonprofit sector to discuss the key issues that are impacting the entire New York City nonprofit sector, which includes human services organizations, arts and, arts and culture, environment and education groups, philanthropy, and many more. We are a group that's united and committed to rebuilding our sector and our city in a way that makes ra racial equity a fundamental condition of success. Nonprofits really are fundamental to how community members support one another with life-saving services, how we create and make art together, how we learn and grow, and how we create meaningful change. We're really grateful to the candidates who are joining us today. Uh, and I'm really grateful and very happy um, to introduce our moderator, Dr. Christina Greer, who's a political scientist, associate professor at Fordham, author of Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, co-host of FAQ NYC, co-host of What's For Us Pod, and a frequent commentator on MSNBC, and most importantly, has a kick-ass background and great classes, and I always enjoy spending time with her. <laughs> That's really what matters here today. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to her, but again, just really want to thank everyone for coming. Thank the candidates for joining us. Um, thank my partner, Nonprofit New York and Advocacy Institute, um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Greer. Thank you so much for joining us today and leading us in this. Thank you so much, Michelle, and I'm honored to be here, uh, especially as a former board member of HSC. You all are doing some amazing work. Uh, so we know that the nonprofit sector is a fundamental part of New York City uh, and the region. It's critical for its survival and recovery and a key part of what makes our city diverse and vibrant and special is the nonprofit community. And so we know that 2020 exposed and exacerbated racial inequity and disparities that have defined our systems for far too long. We see this in the data on COVID-19 fatalities, in the failures of remote learning for parents out there, in the dramatic increases in food insecurity, and in who was excluded from financial relief, and in which arts, culture, and civic organizations are barely able to stay afloat. And these are just a few painful examples I can present today. Nonprofit organizations have displayed resilience, innovation, creativity, grit, in the face of multiple overlapping and compounding crises. Throughout the COVID crisis, the nonprofit sector has responded to increased needs with diminished resources and quickly pivoted to provide emergency services all across the city. The next mayor must recognize the crucial role all nonprofits play as employers, economic engines, and important partners in achieving a livable, equitable city. The candidates who are joining us today are two candidates, Diane Morales and Eric Adams. We'll have a set time for each question for each candidate and then some time for follow-up questions. We'll also have a question from a nonprofit worker and a recipient of nonprofit services. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome a candidate for the 110th mayor of New York City, Diane Morales. Hi, Diane, how are you? Hey, good afternoon, Christina. How are you? It's good to see good. you. Good, I could and should you. say welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like. That's why I'm here. Well, we're glad to have you here, especially since um, so many of your uh, challengers did not think that talking to the nonprofit community uh, was something that they could fit into their busy schedules. And we know that you have limited time today, so I just want to jump right into it. I want to give you a minute or so uh, just to uh, it, reintroduce yourself or introduce yourself to sure, uh, sure. the 400 some odd folks on the call right now. Sure. Um, so it's great to be home. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to reconnect with, um, you know, my, my fellow folks from the field. Um, as you all know, I, I think many of you know, I, I jumped into this race 
because I've been on your side of the table for, for decades, um, because I understand the critical role that human service providers play um, in supporting so many New Yorkers, and even more so right now, understand the critical role that you all will play moving forward in order to, to move our city away from this, this, the current multiple crises that have plagued us over the course of the last uh, year and a half in particular, but we, we, as we all know, for decades before that. Um, I am a, a, a reflection of the work that we all have done. Um, I have fought alongside you to get uh, fair pay for the work that we do, to get recognition for the role that we play in the city. That is part of the agenda that I am bringing with me to City Hall. Um, my expectation and my hope is that you all will come with me and co-create the future together in such a way that we are elevating and prioritizing the communities that we serve so that we're no longer having to tinker around the edges and address the symptoms, but are actually able to fundamentally transform the systems and structures that result in the deep inequities and injustices that plague so many of our community members. I'm happy to be here. I apologize in advance. Uh, no disrespect, I am in transit to the next thing and I have a hard stop at noon, but I definitely wanted to um, spend just a, at least a few minutes with you all here um, to, to have you hear from me and to hear from you. So thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you for that opening statement. So in just for the next two minutes, can you tell us <laughs> specifically what role do you think the nonprofits play in creating an equitable New York? And if elected, how will you work with nonprofits to create more equity within the city? Sure. Um, listen, I, you know, I think I've made it crystal clear in my platform. So much of my platform hinges on the work of the nonprofit community, whether that's about um, you know, the greater ecosystem that would support the community first responders department. Once I defund the NYPD by $3 billion, a significant chunk of those dollars will go to the human services sector to provide the connections and the resources to folks in crisis that they need, whether that be in so far as housing is concerned or mental health or substance abuse. Um, I understand the critical role that, uh, that I'm gonna rely on, that so many people are gonna rely on you all to play or whether we're talking about the um, investment in job creation so that we can actually build a green New York City and who it is that's gonna be responsible for partnering with CUNY and the city and the jobs market to help train and support our workers so that they are equipped to take on these challenges and really able to um, you know, move into the workforce in a successful way. Most importantly, you know, I, I think it's, it, I, I recognize that we've got to ensure that the contracting process for all of you moves smoothly and quickly, um, that you're not forced to actually start providing services before your contracts are registered and before you are uh, able to, to begin billing for the, for the costs that you're gonna undoubtedly incur. Um, I also, I'm gonna say this last thing and then I'm gonna get back to, to Christina. Uh, I also recognize who our workers are. I recognize that our workers live literally, so many of them one paycheck away, um, from ins insecurity, um, total insecurity, and that they are many, uh, largely black and brown women from this community, from our city. And so uh, it's important for us to make sure that they are being paid uh, just wages um, and able to live securely. So I'll leave it Thank you. There. I'm gonna Thank pass you. it off now to Sophia Harrison, who's the executive director of the Arts House Schools. Sophia, are you there? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good, after Ms. good afternoon, Ms. Morales, and all in attendance today, I'm Sophia Harrison, the Executive Director of Arts House Schools Music and Dance um, and Fine Art, a non-for-profit arts and cultural institution in Coney Island, Brooklyn. We serve as children ages 3 to 17 and senior citizens. So my question for you, Ms. Morales, the non-for-profit workforce is made up primarily of women and people of color. How, mm -hmm. if at all, are they integrated into your economic development plan to create a stronger economy? You mm -hmm. have uh, two minutes for that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as I, as I referenced, I recognize that um, the 64% actually of our workers are, are women and uh, the vast majority of them are, are women of color. We need to make sure that our, that first of all, that, that all of our nonprofit organizations are actually being paid um, for the full value of their work rather than the traditional 80 cents on the dollar. Um, we need to make sure that we are lifting the floor. I hate to use that expression, but that's the reality, lifting the floor on the wages um, for our, our workers. 
um, so that you know anybody who's working in the nonprofit sector um, is not necessarily getting paid less than city counterparts who might be actually doing the same work and getting paid so much more. Um, so we, we need to make sure that that is happening. The other thing is, you know, I've prioritized the care economy as part of the, the new economy, economy for New York City. Um, I recognize that so many of the folks in the sector are actually doing work to make it possible for the rest of, you know, for other people in New York City to work, right? Whether we're talking about um, childcare or um, early childhood education or home care, or disability or long-term care, um, those folks actually, it's been crystal clear as a result of the, the pandemic, those folks are actually the, 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 the glue, the heart and soul of our city. Um, so we need to expand those, um, those career pathways, but we also need to make sure that they are bolstered with fair wages and protections and all the securities and access to, to resources um, and benefits that our communities need to move away from the sort of in unstable status that they currently hold and actually be able to live securely and in dignity themselves. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Sophia, for joining us today. So Diana, I've got another question for you. Um, we wanna know what are the most important lessons you've learned from the COVID-19 crisis in relation to nonprofits? How would you engage nonprofits in developing and implementing recovery plans for New York City? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if I'm being totally honest, uh, after uh, you know 35 years in the nonprofit sector, I can't really say that COVID-19 taught me anything new about the role of nonprofits. Um, I, I value, respect, and appreciate the critical role that nonprofits play in, in keeping the city operating and in taking care of so many New Yorkers. I think what, um, what I bring to the table here is the idea of recognizing the expertise that um, the sector brings in terms of what is happening on the ground, in terms of what our communities really need, and in terms of how to get that work done. And so, you know, what we're talking about is a Morales administration that would actually bring nonprofits to the table, not in any kind of symbolic way, um, not in any kind of you know, performative way, as so many of us have served on so many commissions and so many councils and so many advisory groups um, that really just check a box so that we can say we, we sat there, but actually are not um, true partners in, in the design or the execution of the strategies and solutions that our communities need. Um, you all would be at the table. My administration is focused on the idea of co-creating with people on the ground um, who are closest to the solutions because they're closest to the challenges. Um, and you all would have a genuine seat at the table in terms of helping to design what those strategies need to look like, um, making sure that we understand what the costs are associated with that and making sure that we are moving forward together with a shared vision for what it is we need to do to elevate and uplift our communities. Thank you. And, you know, I oftentimes call them task force to nowhere. <laughs> we yes. have those quite a bit in academia. Absolutely. Um, so we want to know what steps would you take to strengthen the contracting process and enhance <laughs> the quality of contracted services for nonprofits of all sizes and the communities they serve? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple of different um, approaches here. I think there's, there's um, small and kind of much more local nonprofit organizations that really need um, support with the whole with navigating the whole contracting process, right? Because they are at a disadvantage to some of our larger um, count, some of their larger counterparts who have you know robust teams and staffs to to navigate that. So I think that's one of the things in terms of leveling the playing field that we really have to do. We have to recognize the value that some of the smaller um, nonprofits bring to the table, who are often much more reflective of the the sort of ethnic and linguistic composition of the communities that they seek to serve. That being said, I think you know we need to streamline the process altogether from 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 uh, from RFP to to actual contracting. Um, not only do you know folks from the sector need to be at the table in terms of designing what that process looks like, but you know I think the city needs to be held accountable and the the sort of metrics for success need to include um, the time frame, how long it takes to actually get this this stuff done. Um, and also, you know, how, how much we are, how quickly we are turning around payment to um, nonprofit organizations. Those are the kinds of things that there should be a sort of public report card, if you will, much the way HSC has um, created um, that, that measures the success of my administration um, based on the commitments that I'm making in terms of being able to streamline the bureaucratic process 
and make sure that, um, that you all are getting paid in a timely manner because no contract should actually start before it has actually been in executed. No one should be required to, uh, to provide loans to the city for work that the city is asking them to do. And so that is one of the things that um, I would begin to tackle immediately with all of you at the table. Well, following up with that, how do you think that being a nonprofit leader prepares you for being mayor uh, based on what you just laid out for us? <laughs> so I, I think you know, one of the things that's, uh, that I talk about often is, well, you know, if there's nobody else in this race who understands what it means to be reimbursed at 80 cents on the dollar and yet be expected to deliver a dollar's worth of services, to be expected to do that um, without compromising quality, and to also be expected to do that in such a way that you're successful enough to grow and expand your services. Um, so that, you know, that level of, of budget management, um, of being able to figure out how to close those gaps and deliver the best quality for the least amount of money is a skill that is going to serve me particularly well in New York City as we engage in, you know, as we enter this period of time that so many are referring to as a period of austerity, although I fundamentally reject that notion anyway. Um, but those skills, the ability to um, work across silos, many of our organizations have different departments who are focused on sort of one thing, um, understanding how to get people to work together towards a, sh a shared vision um, and integrate services um, understanding how to make sure that everyone in an organization, no matter where they are, from the receptionist to the senior leadership team, feels valued, understands their role in terms of the execution of the mission, um, and, and feels like they get a sense of, of satisfaction and worth on a day-to-day -day basis. These are all things that um, are at, at scale, can be brought to bear on the city level, because we know that nobody, nobody gets up and goes to work um, wanting to feel like they're not making a difference. Um, and so those things are all, for me, scalable from my experience as the CEO of, of human service organizations. So nonprofits work across many city agencies. How would you mm -hmm. ensure that city agencies collaborate with one another and work effectively together to more effectively and efficiently support communities? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been talking about for a long time that, it, that you know, doesn't seem uh, sexy on the campaign trail, but I think my nonprofit, uh, my former nonprofit colleagues will appreciate um, is the idea of really actually making sure that organ that agency, city agencies are, co are coordinating, collaborating, and um, being integrated in a comprehensive way. The reality of it is that our, um, our agencies should be focused on and centered around the people that we're supposed to be serving. Um, right now, the reverse is true. The folks who need uh, access to services across the city have to jump through all sorts of hoops from one agency to the other. There's no coordination. Um, you know, we need to actually reorient our system so that uh, the, our people are at the center. Um, for those of you who know that I ran the door for many, many years, um, the, you know, I think the door is actually a perfect model for thinking about how it is that we can integrate services across the board. Young people walk into the door, they get mental health services, they get legal services, they get healthcare services, and to them, their experience is seamless. The work of coordination and integration happens behind the scenes so that, uh, you know, the, the emphasis and the labor of making that happen, that burden is actually on, should be on the city. Uh, it should not be on the people who are most vulnerable and actually seeking help. Um, and so I would work to do that. One of the things I've called for already um, in terms of housing is a, a, a deputy mayor that would actually not just have all the housing agencies under their umbrella, but actually be responsible for coordinating a strategy and a plan that is integrated and comprehensive. And I think that we can do the same thing for human services. Thank you. And so nonprofits help New Yorkers like me lead longer and healthier lives. What are your priorities to ensure all New Yorkers have more and easier access to the nonprofit services across the city that you've laid out for us? Sure. So, you know, nonprofits are really the, the backbone of, of a lot of the plans in my platform. Um, you know, we need to make sure that they are integrated relatively seamlessly into our school system, into our workforce system. Um, in a way that, uh, you know, our community members 
are accessing those services. We know actually that that nonprofits are trusted um, community agents where, where, where folks feel like uh, they know who they're getting their services from. They have relationships with those people. Um, and that is something that we need to actually build on and, and just leverage. I think, you know, the human services sector knows what they're, they, we know what we're doing. We, y'all know what you're doing. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the idea of deferring to your expertise, of leveraging your expertise, of allowing you to lead in that process, rather than um, exploiting, quite frankly, um, what you what you provide to communities and, and, and taking that for granted, I think is a shift in orientation that is long overdue. Mm. And what else do you think is important for New Yorkers to know about how you'll partner with nonprofit organizations? I mean, I, you know, I think it's important to recognize that, um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of talk in this, um, in this race right now about, you know, I started talking of a year, but a year ago about trusted, credible messengers. And, and a lot of my colleagues in this race have adopted that language. And I'm really pleased about that. Um, you know, I, I think that that is, that is a really important thing for, for the sector to hold on to and recognize. And from a position of strength, uh, you know, there is so much more power in the human service. I've said that y'all know I've been saying this for a long, long time. There's so much more power and strength than y'all give yourselves credit for. Um, it's really important to, to wield that in a way that, uh, that really advances the collective good. Um, and, and in me, you know, you, you've got somebody who's going to champion, champion that um, and really advocate for that. And how do you plan on working with the state, not just Governor Cuomo, <laughs> but also uh, those in Albany to get sure. some of the money and some of the policies pushed through on a statewide level? Yeah, you know, I think, I think we're in a, a, the best position um, at the state level, with the exception of the governor, um, that we've been in in a really long time, given, given the, the legislature now. We, we have folks who are really championing, championing some of our most vulnerable and marginalized communities um, I, I think there's a there is a shared a largely shared vision. Um, as many of you know, you know I've gotten I've gotten quite a bit of support from folks in the state legislature: uh, Gustavo Rivera, uh, Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, Marcela Mitanes, Jabari Brisport. Um, there is an, an opportunity here, a window here, um, with the sort of newly elected progressives who share our goals, who share our values for our communities, um, and I think we should take advantage, quite frankly, and, and leverage that window. Um, and push for all of the things that um, up until now have been so challenging for us to get in terms of uh, our, our own reimbursements, our health insurance and health care healthcare coverage, and the protections for our workers and our communities that, that we need and deserve. So, and I guess, you know, because we want to let you out of here on time, uh, any closing statements you may have or anything else you want to, to share with uh, those on the call today? Yeah, I mean, I want to remind you all that uh, two years ago, I, you know, this was not this was not a, a twinkle in my eye. Um, I'm not a traditional candidate. Um, I I, um, I am bringing some radical, transformative ideas to the table for what is a radical, potentially transformative time. I want to stress and impress upon us, and I am going to say us deliberately, that we have a unique window of opportunity right now to forward our agenda in an unprecedented kind of way. We, it's not okay for us to settle for anyone who is tinkering around the edges or reforming the status quo because the status quo wasn't working for the communities that we serve. It's time for us to coalesce and really push for the kind of radical change that we deserve. So we're not going back to normal under my administration. We're gonna co-create a new New York City and that New York City will be one that we all deserve and that enables all of our communities to live in dignity. So I'm really glad that I could be here with all of you today. Um, I look forward to seeing you out there um, and I appreciate the opportunity and the patience and the grace with me um, being in transit and not having a lot of flexibility on timing. Great, well, thank you so much for joining us. For those who are interested in more, they can go to your website at Diane NYC. Uh, I, I will say your t-shirt that just launched is, is really, um, it mm -hmm. caught my eye because so much of this this race centers around a lot of people saying, well, I like her ideas, but I just, you know, I don't know if it's possible. And I, I think, you know, especially people in the nonprofit sector who have had to 
do the impossible with some really great constraints. Uh, for those of you who have not seen that just yet, uh, Diane Morales' mm -hmm. campaign just launched a t-shirt that says, she is viable if you vote for her. And so that is a, a larger conversation that I thought was really fascinating that she just approached head on, which is I'm not a traditional candidate. And if you like what you hear and you wanna help social service organizations, then you actually have to vote. So best of luck. Um, thank, thank you for you. joining us today and prioritizing the nonprofit sector <laughs> and human services um, across the city by joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Christina. Thanks everyone. Take care, stay safe. Thank you. So Michelle, I just wanted to, you know, sort of make a, a, a brief statement, if you will, um, uh, on behalf of the fact that many candidates did not prioritize joining this forum despite months of outreach. Um, and we wanted to articulate that work still needs to be done to build our political power. Uh, and so we don't just hope that the next mayor will work in partnership with our sectors, the human services sector, uh, nonprofits, but we must continue to fight for our place at the table. And so many folks in this, uh, in this work can't, uh, can't offer endorsements, uh, many folks can't offer money, but nonprofits are critical for the city's survival and recovery, and they're a key part of what makes our diverse and vibrant city special. So we are, as human service providers and nonprofits, important employers, service providers, and community builders across every zip code in this city. And as a sector, nonprofits employ 18% of the private workforce. And the majority of these employees are women and Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So my message and our message to candidates who could not join us today is that nonprofits are fundamental to how community members support one another with life-saving services, how we create and make art together, how we learn and grow, how we fuel our democracy, and how we create meaningful change. So working in collaboration with us would strengthen any administration. And I do wanna thank Diane Morales and Eric Adams who will be coming up shortly uh, for recognizing the importance of this work that everyone on this call does. Michelle, I appreciate the work that you have been doing to corral and coalesce all of these leaders in the work that they do and thank you for providing this space for candidates to come in and articulate their vision for the city. Thanks, Christina. And I th thanks for you know, delivering that message, too. I think it's really important. Um, the nonprofit sector, we, like you said, can't endorse candidates. Um, and uh, we stay out of the political fray, both legally and you know, because we serve communities. And so that makes it tough. And I think we see that today uh, in who should prioritize and who didn't. We know, you know, well, half the city is running for mayor at one point, but um, it's not everyone can make everything. There's a lot of competing events, but you know the sector is usually kind of at the bottom. And as you pointed out, the nonprofit sector, it's the largest private uh, employer in the state of New York. Nationally, the nonprofit sector is bigger than the airline industry. Um, and you, you better believe if uh, American Airlines had a mayoral forum, <laughs> right. everyone would show up, right? right. So, um, you know, I think that that's, it's, it's a real reckoning and I appreciated what, what Diane Morales pointed out about us stepping into our own power as a sector um, and how we, you know, how we ourselves have to organize. And that's something that, you know, we wanted to put together today to show the candidates, you know, we have over 500 people on with us today. Um, that's not a bad representation. Everyone has Zoom fatigue already. It's a Friday afternoon, but, you know, people really showed up to hear from the candidates. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think as we get closer to June 22nd, you know, I know a lot of folks are still on the fence. I know a lot of people are unsure as to how ranked choice voting will work. You know, I would implore everyone on the call to really think about uh, skill sets. No one's ever prepared to be a mayor, right? We know that when LBJ was president of the United States and he's dealing with Vietnam and the civil rights struggles across the country, and it seemed like the entire country was just ablaze internationally, he was sort of losing his grasp on everything. And someone says, yeah, how do you feel? You're just, you're losing, right? Everything you touch, you're losing. And he says, you know what? It could be worse. I could be a mayor, right? And we know that being a mayor is an 80 hour a day job. And so I think it's important for all of us to really think about the qualities and skill sets and character of the type of mayor we're interested in. Um, and so no one's ever fully prepared for what's gonna be thrown at them in a city of almost 9 million people with you know, negotiations, uh, financially on the state level and also on the federal level. But hopefully when we're thinking about what nonprofits need, 
we can look closely at candidates who prioritize uh, funding for this large sector, funding for the arts work. When we heard from Sophia and the work that they're doing, you know, in Coney Island, it is important for us to make sure we elect someone or select a series of people who understand the necessity of that work, because not only does it create a vibrant city, it creates a safer city. It creates a more abundant city. It creates a city that sort of has roots and longevity because we know for every little child that is, that is educated and cultivated and you know, cherished uh, at Sophia's organization and all the organizations of the people who are represented on this call, we're investing in the city in a short-term and long-term way. And so think about candidates that actually value that investment, I think is mm -hmm. something that will help us make our decision on June 22nd and will most likely make the decision a lot more clear uh, when it's, it's time to happen. Yeah, and I think that's so important. You know, the a lot of the nonprofit sector issues, and this is for arts and cultures, human services are about process, right? And how the city works um, and the bureaucracy, too much bureaucracy, or just how government has to work, right? Which is, that's, you know, the, the hoops everyone has to jump through. And, you know, when we think about, I think COVID in particular, the nonprofit sector is, absolutely crucial to recovery you know after something like superstorm sandy we need to get the power back on and the subways running and houses rebuilt so with covid both you know in the immediate response and in recovery nonprofits are really the key to how new york recovers um human services obviously you know those are the groups that i represent whether it's the home delivered meals and home checks that and keeping shelters open during covid but also you know eviction prevention services when that eviction moratorium comes out helping people with, you know, the same jobs are not returning to New York to so doing employment and training. But then when we think about, you know, education, obviously, and the amount of, um, you know, getting kids back on track, arts and cultures, you know, if this mayor, current mayor, next mayor wants to talk about tourism, how to bring people back to New York, that's our museums, that's our art scene, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, so there's nonprofits really play a role in getting New York back up and running. Um, mm -hmm. and it's about funding us appropriately, but it's also about partnering with us and figuring out, um, you know, what are the aspects of how we create programs and fund them, um, so that New York right. can return, you know, build, you know, what do they keep saying? Like build back better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know? right. But I mean, and I think it's also an interesting opportunity for us to be able to think about building back differently as well, right? We don't actually have to rebuild the same exact thing. Yeah, New York kind of reminds me of a, a dear friend of mine many, many years ago uh, had a fire in her apartment building. Um, and so she went to work and when she came home, her entire apartment building was on the ground. And she had to literally rebuild her life. She had on her work clothes and her gym clothes and her, her car, that was it. Um, and she had to rebuild her life from literally the ground up, but she didn't replicate the same exact life that she had. So she said, this is actually the opportunity for me to buy different things, to invest in different things. And I think that we're at a crucial point in New York, where when we look at mayoral candidates, you know, we think about the people who want to invest in say Wall Street or tech companies or people who want to invest, you know, in policing. But where is that conversation about all the nonprofits that will actually bolster a real diverse thinking of how we rebuild the city? Because actually there were definitely parts of the city that weren't working for most. Um, they weren't working for many, and people were really struggling well before COVID. Uh, and so how do we conceptualize a leader who will hire the folks that, that get that message as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's exactly right, is that, you know, um, what nonprofits need to recover is not necessarily different from what they were advocating for before. Right? <laughs> pay us on time, pay us fully, design contracts that, you know, serve communities, um, allow us to engage in the process and have the seat at the table. And, you know, and so I think this next mayor does have that opportunity to say, you know, how do I want to build this city? And also I think, you know, we're doing a nonprofit forum, we're representing nonprofits specifically, but nonprofits are integrated into every piece of New York, uh, as you just laid out, whether it's, if we're talking about community policing um, and, you know, nonprofits play a role in that. If we talk about tourism, nonprofits play a role in that. It's, you know, we should be at every table because we represent every community and every aspect of, you know, what I think makes New York a great place to live. And as a non-native, you know, <laughs> my adopted city, right? Like, and you know, nonprofits are on every corner. You know, the, the current mayor goes to a, a nonprofit gym. Um, yes. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to be good today and not yeah. 
expand on that. As soon as that started to come out, I was like, uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> so, but you know, we all utilize nonprofits. And I think we, especially during this pandemic, I think a lot of people saw kind of how, how integral nonprofits were to their lives. There are a lot of people who didn't find themselves food insecure until this pandemic, whether it was because they couldn't leave their home and so needed to have food delivered. You know, so I think that there's a, a lot of those aspects of, um, and I really appreciate what you said about like, you know, this is a chance to build a better city and a different city. And, you know, I think having equity and nonprofits at the table centered in these conversations, all of those conversations will be super mm -hmm. critical. Great. Well, it looks like we have uh, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams <laughs> uh, joining us today to speak to us. Hello. How are you, Borough President Adams? Good, good to see you. Um, sorry that I'm in the vehicle, uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, I have this little project going on called Running for Mayor, and it's taking me all over the city. <laughs> we understand we're a five borough city. I like to see that seatbelt, so I'm very happy about that. We know that you've got a pretty hard out. So I just want to give you a minute to make an opening remark to all the, the members who are on the call today uh, for the Human Services uh, family. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, you filled the gap, uh, all of you, and I want to thank you not only as a state senator and a ball president, but I want to thank you as a child that uh, grew up uh, in South Jamaica, Queens, after leaving Brownsville, where I was born. And it was through the nonprofits that gave my mother the ability uh, to fill the gaps in raising uh, my uh, five uh, siblings and me. Uh, the number of times that we were able to, to have that turkey for Thanksgiving, the supportive services of when we were going through domestic violence situations at home, uh, the support even when I was arrested, uh, being able to go to the counseling programs that nonprofits put in place uh, to really help me cycle out of that very difficult and painful period in my life. And so what you have done then, uh, you are doing now, and the next mayor must understand the important roles and build a real partnership with the nonprofits. And so I look forward to this conversation. Great, so first question is, what role do you think the, non the nonprofits play in creating an equitable New York? And if elected, how will you work with nonprofits to create more equity within the city? Well, you're on the ground uh, in a real way. And so when we talk about uh, how we utilize our tax dollars uh, by what we pay through our agencies, we often miss uh, the nonprofits in the city. Uh, they are really closing that gap uh, on the ground and having number one, uh, understand how to communicate in a language that people understand, understand the cultural norms and uh, the ability to just take the time that's needed to navigate people out of of their traumatic situations and environment. I have partnered with a number of uh, nonprofits throughout uh, my uh, time in not only government, but also as a police officer of uh, having people uh, refer to the right agencies to address their concerns is something that we often overlook. And so I believe the next mayor must have a clear liaison at uh, City Hall who's going to navigate government ensure proper uh, return of payment is from the services you provide, be consistent, don't have one agreement when you sign up a nonprofit to provide a service and then change it midway and have greater flexibility in using the funds that you receive, such as the metro costs that were not needed uh, during COVID-19 because people were home, you should have been able to utilize those dollars in other ways is that you identify people needed resources. So how would you more specifically define uh, your equity analysis and, and what you would undertake? Well, uh, I believe, and I say this over and over and I'm saying it through the campaign because I want it to resonate with people. Our city, uh, the city is dysfunctional and that dysfunction, dysfunctionality lies in its agencies. Uh, we create conflicts. And those conflicts, actually, uh, they are creating the inequalities that we're seeing. And in a lifetime pulling people out of the river, no one goes upstream in, in the first place. 
uh, we have just professionalized pulling people out of the river. And when you look at who's being pulled out, they're black, brown, and immigrants. And so that inequality in every area of government is what we need to zero in on. Everything from uh, dyslexia, which 30% of our prison population, uh, the men and women are dyslexic. Uh, we should be having the proper non nonprofit interaction in our schools to fight dyslexia, learning disability, healthcare. Some of my partners in healthcare, uh, the inequalities that you see in healthcare, where we're watching people have generational issues with chronic diseases. Uh, those inequalities are stark and they're real uh, throughout our city. Foster care, children aging out of 21. We know they're more likely uh, to not graduate from high school and deal with mental health is issues, homelessness, yet we're not proactively doing anything. So you look at the part of this city and you will see the inequalities, the same ethnic groups are experiencing those inequalities. So we're, we're curious, thank you for that. Um, the nonprofit workforce is made up primarily of women and people of color. How, if at all, are they integrated into your economic development plan to create a stronger economy? Yes, yeah, so when I do an analysis of who is actually employed in my nonprofits, trust me, I'm coming up with a, a, an overwhelming number of women and an overwhelming number, number of people of color, as you indicated. And it's about how do we ensure of pay parity and pay equity. Uh, I led the way in city government when Letitia James as the council person did analysis of fair pay and pay equity for women. She found there was one agency that led the entire city. Uh, women were being paid 13% more than men. And my staff is overwhelmingly uh, women of color. And we need to do a real time analysis of, across the board to make sure that we are giving our nonprofits a fair a fee of a fair distribution of dollars to make sure that they are also paying of their employees a living wage so we can move those employees into middle class. You should not have to uh, be a person that helps someone with homeless services and then you find yourself in a shelter at the same time. Uh, so we are going to lift up these nonprofits and we can also lift up the women who are involved and many of them are heads of single households. So we should be there to ensure that we stabilize their, their community. Because hurt people hurt people. And that vicarious trauma is real. And if we're not given the right financial assistance, we're going to continue to see that vicarious trauma grow even further. So what are the most important lessons you've learned from the COVID-19 crisis in relation to nonprofits? And how would you engage nonprofits in developing and implementing recovery plans for New York City? Well, the, probably the most important thing I've learned was because I was on the ground. You know, I say this over and over again. Uh, many people fled and I led, you know, moving into Borough Hall and setting up shop because I didn't want to infect um, and with COVID as I moved around. And everywhere I traveled, I saw nonprofits um, placing themselves in harm's ways from food pantry with Dr. Melanie uh, Samuels over at a campaign against hunger, the millions of meals that she distributed knocking on doors and speaking to uh, our elderly, elderly, checking on our seniors who are afraid to go to, uh, go to. Uh, the partnership we did in the NYCHA developments, uh, make sure our seniors get everything from access to medicine uh, to uh, dealing with ensuring that they were receiving uh, food. Uh, the nonprofits that helped uh, drive uh, seniors and others to hospitals, uh, delivering PPEs and masks. Uh, so what I clear signal that I received is that we need to ensure our nonprofits, again, one, have a greater flexibility so that they can properly utilize uh, the dollars that are coming from the city. Uh, number two, payment. Uh, I was disappointed to hear that there were many agreements made on payment just for the city to come back and do something differently. You need to be consistent because when we are not true to what we commit to pay, you have to be able to ensure you can provide for your employees and for provide for the constituencies that you're helping. 
And those were two things that jumped up, jumped off at me. And finally, the ability to fill that gap in services that, that I believe that gap is also created by the lack of what we're doing in our agencies. And, and lastly, if I must say, uh -huh. language access. Uh, mm -hmm. Language uh, access was important. Uh, we communicate. I'm sorry, you wanted to say something else? No, no, no. okay. You I think there was a, a, I can. Okay. There was a touch of a delay. Okay, okay. sorry about that. Uh, language access. Uh, the city communicated during COVID in English only. It acted like this was the English only pandemic. And what I found for my nonprofits that they were able to communicate with people with basic instructions, uh, basic things that they needed to know and the level of the various languages uh, that we had to communicate with people uh, to the everyday New Yorkers. Uh, and so that was crucial for me and that was something I observed. Can you expand on that just really briefly how you would create a system, say like a comp stat and how it would evaluate and track services provided by the city to ensure streamlined contracting and timely payments in implementing some of these policies? Mm -hmm. You, you, are, you are talking on my alley, you know, I'm a, I was a designer of the OLTPS system. Uh, it was the prelude to Comstat, and that's what we have to take our city to real time. Uh, real time, you should be able to, uh, my My City, uh, my My City card that I talk about, we need to completely streamline uh, these uh, sub services and streamline uh, the uh, cash payments that we owe our nonprofits uh, in, a, in, a, in a real way, trying to navigate government, trying to ensure uh, a net 30, next, next 60 payment. Uh, it is taking too long and you shouldn't have to fill out doc paper forms over and over again. Once you are a nonprofit, you have a great track record, you provide a service for one or two years, uh, we should be able to fast track these payments without having to reinvent the wheel. Every time you have to get a, a payment, uh, it should be automatically carried out because you already have the greenhouse keeping seal of approval that you're doing the job, providing the services. You should not have to go back and do it over and over again. And we must bridge technology to make this a more expeditious in the fashion. So what steps would you take to strengthen the contracting process and enhance the quality of contracted services for nonprofits of all sizes and the communities they serve? Well, number one, we have to get paper out of the business and we need to put paper out of the business. Uh, all of this could be done online. Uh, all of this can be done in a more uh, streamlined fashion. And then we will have one portal. Uh, one agency, let the agencies go agency from agencies, but track in real time. You should be able to look at uh, one app that we can design where you will see exactly uh, where your documents are located, when the payment is coming in, uh, if there's a, some form of delay in the process. We have to take the unpredictable, we have to take the unpredictability out of payment services and the procurement process. There's too much uncertainty. And it's because we're still using antiquated methods of doing so, and we need to streamline that process. And the technology is here to do so. And this is, this is my whole concept of placing our city in a real-time governing model so that we can take the guesswork out of that. You remove that guesswork, you are able to focus on just the services that you are providing. You're spending too much time trying to navigate government and the dysfunctionality of government. That time should be used to assist people who are in need. You're on mute. Sorry, yeah, I had to mute. I had some Brooklyn, <laughs> some Brooklyn <laughs> noise behind me. I was trying not to interrupt you. Um, you know, our borough keeps it keeps it popping at all times. Um, I want to bring on Will Woods of Urban Pathways. He has a specific question for you. Hi, Will, welcome. Hi, you all, thank you for having me. How are you, sir? Thank you for your time today. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Willie Woods and I'm a participant in Urban Pathways Supportive Housing Program. Uh, before that though, I did spend almost two years within the shelter system with a severe chronic condition. In fact, uh, living in the shelter system was killing me. Um, 
being able to link up with Urban Pathways, they provided me a stable platform to be able to recover and to reinvest in my health in addition to help me look for affordable housing on my own. So it's very clear in my own life that being able to work with nonprofit agencies helped me live a longer life, helped me live a healthier life. I'm sure that that's something possible for other New Yorkers. What are your priorities, sir, to ensure that all New Yorkers like me have easier and increased access to nonprofit services across the city? Sorry, brother, repeat that again. I'm on the highway. You, you, no problem. And, uh, what are your yeah, priorities? Just... What are your priorities to ensure that all New Yorkers like me have more and easier access to nonprofit services across the city? I, I believe asking um, easier access to the nonprofits across the city? Correct. Yeah, I really apologize for going in and out. Uh, let me know if you can hear me. Uh, it, it, it is, it's, it's a, an alignment of services. And so you take your case in particular of where you were in a homeless shelter, if I heard you correctly, you were dealing with some health care issues at the same time. And there were probably some employment issues that you were trying to put in place. And so what, it is too expensive to be poor in the city. So what we must do is build a centralized database of the service providers. And instead of having you try to figure out to go from location to location to location, there should be a centralized effort where you will be able to come in, uh, do a real assessment of your needs and coordinate those services for all those who are providing. Once one nonprofit may be uh, handling our workforce development, another nonprofit may be handling uh, the health issues that you want addressed. Another nonprofit must may be handling uh, housing. And if you needed housing, Right now, you have to first go to the nonprofit, find out how much they can give you on uh, housing subsidies, and then you have to go to the city back to find out what HRA is going to do. That makes no sense. So we need to centralize the process and have you have a team to get you back on your feet to the level that you are deserving of receiving. But coordinating those efforts, efforts will allow that to happen, and we're disjointed. We don't allow that coordination. And as the mayor, we're going to do the, just the opposite. We're going to have a centralized system, single platform, where you will come in, fill out one application, and the data and the information of that application will be transferable to all of the agencies. You should not be doing a different application for HRA, a different application for the nonprofit, a different app application for your housing and healthcare needs. That is where. Uh, we are failing. We're spending more time navigating the system instead of giving you the help that you need. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Will, for your question. So, uh, President Adams, nonprofits work across many city agencies. How will you ensure city agencies collaborate with one another and work effectively together to more efficiently support communities? And you, you, you're hitting it out. Uh, off the park right now, that is the problem. We are siloed as a city where agencies are not incentivized to coordinate together. We need to change that incentive and do just the opposite. We must create an environment where you are going to be incentivized and judged. Your success is going to be judged based on the collaborations that you are creating, similar to what I just uh, mentioned to Will. Right now, that's not the incentive uh, to coordinate together to solve the needs and the problems uh, of this city. And so I'm going to make sure that uh, using uh, my nonprofit czar, for lack of a better term, uh, their job is to make sure we have that coordination and that synergy is built out of the CompStat model when you brought the heads of agencies together and you of units together using the police department and you questioned them on collaboration you know where how do we reach the results that we're looking for how are we communicating with those nonprofits there we do not have enough of meetings and coming together on a monthly basis through zoom or technology 
on nonprofits having FaceTime with our agency heads so we can identify what are the barriers and how do we alleviate, alleviate those barriers? And then how do we check up that we're actually alleviate, alleviating those barriers? I bet you the bulk of the nonprofits are rarely getting FaceTime with commissioners to talk about what are the barriers and how do we correct them? I'm going to change that. And how will you also work with the state Governor Cuomo and the legislators in Albany to push through some of these agendas for nonprofits. Are so important because that lack of co collaboration is not only within the city agencies, but you're also seeing a lack of co collaboration on the state level. And the goal is to really create partnership with all of those agencies outside of our span of control to mandate to those state agencies. A perfect example of that uh, around housing. Uh, many of my housing advocates we just need DHCR uh, to assist in giving us information on identifying those landlords that are overcharging tenants. And there's a reluctancy to do so. Uh, the same thing with signing people up automatically for SNAP and other uh, benefits. There's a reluctancy to turn our systems automatic. And so I'm going to really zero in on speaking to the governor's office and show the benefits that, uh, that would come from uh, having this type of technology and collaboration with our city and state uh, uh, agencies so we could be in alignment on how to get a better use of our tax dollars to solve a problem and help those New Yorkers who are in need. Thank you. And in your closing statement, will you let us know what you think is important for us to know and for other New Yorkers to know about how you will partner with nonprofit organizations? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the number one thing I'm going to do is to be a deep listener. Uh, we can learn so much for, from our nonprofits. And you know where the barriers are to giving the people of this city who are in need the care that they deserve. And so I want you to partner with me in building out all the systems. Uh, I'm a system person. Help me build out of how we can do better in the payment. Help me build out uh, what uh, my nonprofit service apps should look like and how do we get it right. Help me to build out the collaboration uh, that's needed. Uh, it is about going to those who are doing the work every day and say, how do we become the best at providing services for those who are in need? Uh, we could do a better job. We can have a better return on our, on our investment. If we do it right, uh, I believe that Nonprofits are providing the service because you're not doing it for profit. You're doing it for the people of the city. And I want to be a partner to build out the right system that no matter who's the mayor, that we are going to be there for those who are in need and those who depend on you to build the bridge and fill the gap from city agencies and services and what you do every day. Well, thank you, Borough President Adams. For those who are interested, you can go to ericadams2021.com. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. We invited several candidates uh, to come and talk to people who care deeply about the nonprofit sector, who work in the nonprofit sector and are recipients of the goods and services provided. You and Diane Morales are the two candidates that made time in your very busy schedules to join us today. And we really appreciate you laying out your vision for how you would lead the city uh, and work in collaboration with nonprofits. So best of luck on June 22nd. And we're deeply grateful for you giving us this time today. Thank you. Take care. Be well, everyone. Okay. All right. Drive safely. <laughs> so, Michelle, I would like to, to thank you for convening this very important conversation. And I'd like to thank all of the participants uh, for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Christina. I really want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to moderate for us and for being such a champion former HSC board member of a champion of all types of nonprofits uh, for making time uh, and for asking some really great questions today. Really appreciate it. Uh, I again want to thank my uh, really fantastic partners at the Advocacy Institute and at Nonprofit New York, as well as the hundreds of organizations who helped join us in this effort um, to pull together the nonprofit platform, which we've shared with all the candidates questionnaires, which many of the candidates filled out, and then also um, this forum today. The nonprofit sector, as you pointed out, is remarkably diverse, and we serve New Yorkers from all walks of life in so many different capacities. Um, and so it was great to be able to hear from some of the candidates and also, um, you know, to 
to make sure we engage the sector in this really important election. So again, thank you, Dr. Greer, for your time today. It was very much appreciated. And thanks to everyone for joining. Have a thank great you. day, everyone.